Hey guys, this is John. So yesterday I had a unique experience in the chess world. Uh, honestly, a pretty unforgettable moment in my chess career. I was able to play a serious game against Grandmaster Ding Liren of China. As of the making of this video, January 2019, he is the number four rated player in the world. And I thought it'd be interesting for you guys to hear my thoughts about this game and also the lead up to the game and you know, what it's like to play such an amazing player because as I said, it's a unique experience for me. I've played Magnus before in a bullet game. I played Fabiano a few times in Blitz Online, but this is a little bit longer of a game. It's a pretty serious game. And I just wanted to share that with you guys because uh, it's a completely different experience, as you might imagine, actually playing one of these guys and feeling their strength as they're playing the moves against you versus just watching them play. And, you know, I follow all the top level tournaments, as I'm sure many of you guys do. And we get kind of lazy when we just click through the games and we're like, okay, good move, good move, good move. But having to respond to their good moves, completely different animal. So this game was played in the Pro Chess League, which is an online league. It is a team league. So I play for the Minnesota Blizzard. Ding Loren plays for the Chengdu Pandas. And this was the first match of 2019. Uh, I believe the season goes for 10 weeks. So very first match. Uh, and the time control was 15 plus 2, 15 minutes with a 2 second increment. The way this league works, you, you play on teams of 4, you can field a team of 4 each week that is, and you play against another team of 4, and it's all play all, so it's a little mini round robin. So you play everyone else on the opposing team, and it's 16 games in total, whoever gets the most points wins the match. And I was playing Grandmaster Ding in the very first game. So. 15 plus 2 time control, I had the white pieces, and honestly, I, I'm going to be completely transparent with you guys, I did not do a whole lot of preparation for this game, openings-wise, for a couple reasons. One, the time control is very fast, so my main goal for myself that I set was just to try to manage my clock, just not get too far behind on the clock, make good opening decisions, follow basic principles, follow what I know, not try to do anything too fancy. Try to start the season off right. You guys know I have perpetual time pressure issues. Uh, and two, and this is the bigger reason, honestly, it's almost impossible to prepare against these guys at the top level. Their opening repertoire is so diversified, and they can play so many mainline defenses well. I, I'm sure Magnus and Fabiano and MVL and, you know, Shakriar Mamadyarov, all these top-level guys kind of know to some degree what uh, to expect when they're playing against top level players, but I sure don't. And <laughs> I, I realized early on, I had a few days to prepare for this game and this match. I realized early on it was kind of pointless to try to predict what was going to happen. He might not even be playing his normal repertoire against me, just a, a lowly IM, almost 400 points lower rated than him. Uh, so I thought, you know what, just play your mainline stuff, John. You have the white pieces. Just stick with what you know and, and see what happens. I did review some basic openings that I thought maybe he might try, like some unbalanced stuff. And actually, I ended up looking at uh, the Grunfeld, which you'll see that we got in this game. So let's get on with it. Oh, I want to say also just my emotions heading into this game, because that might be interesting for you guys to hear. I was strangely calm for this game. You know, um, I'm sure if we were playing in person and I had to walk to the tournament hall and you know, there are all these cameras and stuff and sit down at the board with him very serious and shake hands and play a classical game or something, I'd be more nervous. But playing online from the comfort of my home, I wasn't that nervous. And I just looked at it as an amazing opportunity just to play a game against a player that otherwise I would basically never be able to play. I mean, outside of a league like this, these guys tend to participate in their, their own kind of elite insular events. So just to play him, it already felt like a win to me. So just wanted to do my best. And yeah, I wasn't nervous going into this. So I opened with D4. I stuck with my guns. And Ding played Knight F6. I played C4. He played G6. I played Knight C3. And he played D5. This is the Grunfeld defense. All these moves were played very quickly. C takes D4. Knight takes D4. Here I paused for a minute, deciding what line to play. I played e4, which is by far the main move. Uh, I've also played bishop d2 on occasion, which looks kind of weird, but the idea is if they ever if they ever take on c3, you can recapture with the bishop instead of the pawn, as you usually do. The bishop might be well-positioned on this long diagonal. 
I played some games like this. For instance, bishop g7, e4, takes, bishop takes. This line I don't think is too testing, though. So I just played the main line, e4. Knight takes c3, b takes c3, bishop g7. And here I went for queen a4 check, which is a line I played off and on over the past couple of years. This looks like a almost nonsensical check at first, but it's actually a serious option. The idea is to try to disrupt black's flow of development. Uh, black can block this check in a few different ways. The, the main move, or main moves I should say, definitely white can consider knight f3. There's a great body of theory with that. Bishop c4 is a line that I recommend in my chessable repertoire, my d4 repertoire. Uh, there's other moves too, like bishop e3. But I kind of like this queen a4 move because if black blocks with the bishop, which might be your you know main reaction or something you might think black would normally do to kick the queen away, white can put this queen on a3, which is a common min mini maneuver in this line. It makes it more difficult for black to play c5, which is black's main idea to put pressure on white center in the Grunfeld, combined with this Grunfeld bishop. Uh, also, in some cases, this e7 pawn can be pretty pesky to defend for black, especially if white gets to play bishop g5 and start targeting it with a couple pieces from a distance. I've even seen white play queen b3 here after this bishop d7 move, trying to... Well, I'm really bad with the arrows already, sorry guys. But queen b3 trying to attack b7. Um, knight d7 is also a popular move. In fact, the most popular at this juncture. I faced this a couple times, usually white will... Again, I can't, I can't draw these arrows. Usually white will play knight f3 and continue their development. But Ding played queen d7. Again, kind of like an awkward looking move in reply, but this is all theory. I played bishop b5, not interested in early queen trade. c6, blocking, bishop back to e2. And now he just castled. Uh, black can also play c5 which seems like a crazy idea because white can play the bishop back to b5, but then black can play knight c6, and if d5 appeals to you, well, you got to bear in mind that black can play bishop takes c3 check and fork the king and the rook. So that is going to be problematic for white. But c5 leads to a few more forcing lines. I can understand from his perspective, he's playing someone much lower rated. He probably wants to keep some tension in the position, so he castled instead. And now I played this queen a3 move, so moving the queen again, but the idea is once more to try to hinder this c5 break from black, this method of putting pressure on white center, and also again taking an aim against the e7 pawn. So he played b6, he's going to try to develop his bishop out this way since his queen is kind of blocking it. I played knight f3, now i got to complete my kingside development. Now he played c5, so b6 also supported that pawn advance. I castled, and he played c takes d4. It's also possible for black to play bishop b7. There's been several games in this line, just putting the bishop on this nice diagonal. Two fianchetto bishops attacking the pawn on e4. The Grunfeld is a hypermodern opening. It falls into that category. In hypermodern openings, the person who's playing the hypermodern uh, line is usually trying to put pressure on the opponent's center from a distance. They're not necessarily occupying the center with pawns, as was the traditional chess wisdom for many, many years, but they're using pieces, especially the bishop, to create pressure from a greater distance. It's a pretty effective strategy. So bishop e7 along those same lines. And white usually plays d5. There's a line that goes e6, bishop e3 takes. Black temporarily goes up a pawn, but after rook d1, white usually just wins it back. And I think white's a tiny, tiny bit better here. So instead, Ding just took on d4 right away. I recaptured, and he played bishop b7. It's true that the queen and the bishop are attacking d4, and I only have one defender, but strategically speaking, it would be exceptionally bad for black to trade their dark square bishop for my knight. That's the primary defender of their king. It's a powerful piece, so I'm sure he wasn't interested in this. Um, I could play something like bishop b2, immediately get my bishop on this diagonal. If black continues going pawn hunting, well, he's soon going to regret it. You don't want to get involved with something like this. So I knew there was no chance of that happening after c takes d4. So he played bishop b7. And now I played queen e3, swinging the queen over and defending this pawn. And I was actually in, in my book Knowledge through this point. So this is move number 14. 
neither of us had really used that much time. He played knight c6, continuing to develop, and again taking aim against d4. I need to defend this pawn because I only have two defenders. He has one, two, three attackers. So I played bishop b2. He played rook c8. And the main thing I remembered in this line is that once you put the bishop on b2, you want to continue with rook b1 to try to prepare d5 and look to swap the dark square bishops on this long diagonal. That was the main idea that stood out in my head. So I thought for 30 seconds, 37 seconds here and played rook b1. He played e6. And round about here, I can officially say I was out of my prep. I have seen a game or two in either this exact position or very close to it. But again, this was just the primary idea I had in mind. I knew that the queen also belonged on e3. I had moved it there, if you recall, in order to defend the e4 pawn. So I was feeling you know, still fairly confident at this point. It's nice to get a position I'm at least familiar with. But he played e6, which could make it harder for me to play d5. I played rook fd1. And he responded with knight a5. So this is a common place for the knight on the edge of the board. It can try to transfer into the c4 square. Also, it unveils the bishop once more. And rook c2 is an idea that white has to keep in mind. Black might look to penetrate with the rook to the second rank and cause some problems. So good move coordination-wise. Now this next move is critical. So this is move 18. I spent a little over a minute on this move. And I played something that's probably not sound, but it felt correct. And I think I was a little fired up <laughs> by this game and playing such a good player that I didn't want to back down. I mean, I was spoiling for a fight. <laughs> so many of you probably can predict the move that I played here. It's not a crazy sacrifice or anything, but it does make things sharper. I played d5. But in hindsight, this is probably a mistake. And I know the computer was recommending bishop a3 instead. Attacking this rook here, also perhaps enabling bishop b5 when my rook on b1 would be protecting that bishop. And it was giving a rough uh, evaluation of a quality after rook fd8 and then either knight e5 or this bishop b5 I move, move I mentioned. So pretty close to 0, 0.00. I gotta say, I didn't even look at bishop a3. That was not on my radar at all. And that often happens when you have opening preparation you're following or just an idea from your opening prep you tend to stick pretty closely to that unless there's a very compelling reason to deviate from it. So I played d5, looking to trade these bishops. I knew this was the primary defender of Black's king. But this is an inherently risky move because there's going to be a trade here. And I'm not worried about Black taking this pawn in the short term because there's tactics preventing that. But in the long term, this pawn very well could be weak. It will be a pass pawn, but... Pass pawns are double-edged. If they get blockaded and your opponent can attack them in multiple ways, they can easily be lost. So I knew that, but I was playing for the initiative. I was trying to open lines, and again, especially a trade, this dark square bishop around Black's king. So looking for attacking chances. And now Ding's, Ding spent about a minute and a half on this next move. It was his longest think of the game. He played e takes d5. So he took the pawn. He was probably debating between that and just bishop takes b2 right away. I think they're fairly similar, but he took the pawn immediately. I took on g7, so getting rid of his strong bishop takes. And then I recaptured on d5, which was my plan all along. But I think to avoid what's coming, I probably have to deviate here. The engine was suggesting knight e5, kind of an in-between move attacking the king, uh, attacking the queen rather. There's some ideas of maybe even transferring the knight to g4 and trying to use my influence on the h6 and f6 squares. But again, just like the bishop a3 move, I wasn't even looking at this. e takes d5 was just the consistent move in my mind, so I played it in 21 seconds. Didn't think too hard about anything else. I think maybe the only thing I was considering here was throwing in queen d4 before playing it, but made this capture. And now he played his next move in one second. <laughs> it was just very clear he had this in mind. Uh, and it's a good move. He played queen d6. Blockading this pawn, further blockading it, and also allowing him to play queen over to f6 in many lines, especially if I deliver a check on d4. Very good move. Also keeps the queen out of range of the knight if I ever jump in with the knight and try to attack him. And here, I spent another... 
fairly long period of time for a 15 minute game. I spent 97 seconds. So yeah, a little over a minute trying to figure out what to do because I felt like this was a position where I needed to exploit this, this window of time, this potential initiative that I had, but it was hard. I didn't really come up with anything great here. I wanted to get at my opponent's king, but I, it's not like I can just sink my queen in here or, I mean, these are the squares that really stand out that the king is, is protecting. Um, the dark squares, again, I was seeking to, to eliminate that dark square bishop a, a couple moves ago. I felt like I needed my knight involved because just checking with the queen or trying to make some lone operation with the queen didn't seem like it was going to work. So I ended up playing knight g5, but I, I think that's a bad move. Dubious move at best. The computer says I should just play queen d4 check right away. And black would probably respond with queen f6, offering a queen trade. And even now in analysis, and with the benefit of having seen what, what Stockfish says about this, I just think these endgames are, are better for black. I think with all the pieces on board, this pawn is more likely going to be a weakness. Black already has one attacker. I have a defender, but I have issues to contend with here. Black can play this natural move, bring the rook over to pile on against this. There's still this rook c2 idea in the air, by the way, attacking the bishop and also the pawn. Black's king is, especially comparative to mine, very close to the action. So if stuff gets swapped off, this king could be a fighting piece and even help track down this pawn if necessary. My bishop's not too impressive. So inherently, I was trying to avoid endgames here and looking to attack, but I think knight g5 is a little too ticky-tack and optimistic. So now he played rook f8, attacking my queen. I played queen d4 check, another longish think. Um, not really sure what else I was debating about. Maybe queen f3, I, was, I believe I was thinking about briefly, trying to attack f7. Queen h3, trying to swing the queen over here and attack h7. Looks compelling, but I think black will just respond with h6, and I have multiple loose pieces. Can't forget about this bishop down here. So queen d4 is what I did. And now here, Ding spent a little over a minute, but I think he knew what the best move was. I think he was just trying to assess the resulting position uh, after this move is played. He played queen f6. By far the best move. In fact, I think the only move, because if black blocks with the queen on e5, white has a little tactic here. You can pause your video if you want to try to figure it out. The tactic is knight e6. Nice little interference idea. So if the pawn takes, then I can take the queen, because the rook is no longer defending the queen. So black would have to play rook takes e6, but then I can take back. White wins the exchange. Note that black cannot play queen takes e2 and get the bishop, because that would be illegal. So I was hoping for that, but I knew there was next to no chance that he was going to blunder that. <laughs> uh, likewise, blocking with the rook makes no sense. I can immediately attack the rook, pile on. If f6, that just invites the knight to jump into this beautiful out, outpost square, support of the pawn. Also, if king g8, I have knight e4, which was the main idea of this knight maneuver in the first place. Try to transfer the knight to the e4 square, attack the queen, and land the eagle on f6. That would be a massive fork if I could get that on the king and the rook and... Yeah, black wants no part of that position. So almost by process of elimination, queen f6 is the best move, but he did spend a little time before playing it. And here, this is a clear sign, <laughs> as if I didn't already know it, but just looking at the time management in this game, a clear sign where some, some stuff is going wrong. I spent two minutes on this next move, and I didn't really come up with anything. I realized at this point that I was just worse. So the first thing to look at is what happens if we just trade queens? Because there, black has a double attack on my two pieces. And it's natural to continue with knight takes h7. So that's an in-between move. It's a check. But black goes king g7, and I still have this double attack to deal with. And I looked at this line, bishop b5, hitting the rook. Um, black could try to get two minor pieces. King takes h7, bishop takes e8, rook takes e8. But I also think just rook e5. I was fearful of, of this move, because then my knight is trapped. I can maybe play f4 here, rook takes d5, knight g5, try to evacuate it, but I really don't like this resulting position. There's still this rook c2 move. I think, yeah, rook c2 is probably even stronger now because this bishop is going to be trained on g2 if ever there's a, a trade of rooks along the d-file, so I'd be really struggling here too. It just felt wrong. It felt too loose to go for this. Um, I looked at moving my attacked bishop and just leaving the queen here. And again, queen takes g5 is not a threat because there is a pin here. So 
and my queen's defended. So I did look at moving the bishop, but here's another little puzzle for you guys. If I play bishop b5, what can black do in reply? Pause your video if you like. So the tactically aware among you will immediately spot rook e1. Very nice deflection. So rook e1 check. And I lose material because if rook takes e1, well, there goes my defender of the queen on d4. There goes the neighborhood. And if bishop f1, then queen takes d4, rook takes d4, pick up the rook on b1. Full rook ahead for black. So once I spotted that, I started looking at, you know, safer moves and especially moves to cover the e-file. I think I looked briefly at bishop f1 as well. There's something I didn't like about bishop f1. Um, yeah, if bishop f1, queen takes d4. Ah, yeah, it was this, this variation I had in my notes. Rook takes d4 and he'd be double attacking g5 and d5. So you can see even when the dust settles here and there's a trade, I still have issues with my far-flung pieces and that double-edged pass pawn which is looking more and more like a weakness with every passing move. So I played knight e4, trying to cover the file. Ding traded. I took with a rook. So now I have this knight d6 idea in mind. I got the knight to the e4 square, but he has a pretty simple and good reply. So he adjusted the rook. He played rook e to d8. Just moved the rook over one square, stops knight d6, attacks the d-pawn twice. And I have to start defending that weakness. So I played rook bd1. Note that if I play d6, at minimum black can take on e4 and then take on d6, and I've just lost a pawn. So the further you push a pawn into your opponent's half of the board, the harder it is to maintain. You know, chess is chess is a war game. It's just like having a supply line deep in the enemy territory. You know, never invade Russia in the winter time. Maybe I shouldn't invade with my lone d pawn against the Grunfeld. <laughs> so I was really feeling that here. So I played rook bd1. But that allowed him to play rook c2. And I should say, for the rest of the game, he played very quickly. He already has a time edge at this point, but he was very confident with his decision making until the end of this game. We're on move 25 right now, and the game still goes for a while, as we'll see. But he was firing out these moves. So rook c2, attacking the bishop and the pawn. I just decided to give the a pawn because I don't have a lot of alternatives. If I block with the rook, then I'd be at minimum agreeing to this and then the capture on d5. This just looks like a depressing endgame. The a pawn is still weak. I mean, I guess I could consider something like that, but I feel like I'm just going to gradually lose down the pawn here. No compensation whatsoever. So I figured, let him have the a pawn, then he'll have two versus none, but I get to keep my d pawn. Like, maybe I can still turn this thing around and prove that the d pawn is a, weak, is a strength. That was my, my evaluation of my best chances at least. I knew I was worse, but my best chance, I thought, lies with the d-pawn. So I moved the bishop to f3 and just invited him to take the a-pawn, which he did. And now this is a situation where I feel like in virtually every line going forward, I need to solve the back rank issue with my king. So I haven't moved any of these pawns yet. My rook is needed to defend against checks on the back rank. So I played h4. I think it's a pretty good move. I played it in four seconds. Just make some breathing room for the king. Also, maybe I can play h5 and start trying to probe on the king side. He played rook c2. And I did go ahead and play h5. Again, it's it's hard to justify pushing this pawn because I feel like it's just getting weaker and weaker as I advance it. I would like to push it at some point, but maybe combine it with other threats, possibly directed towards his king. Uh, I didn't really want to open the bishop up unnecessarily. So held off on the d-pawn push. Played h5. He brought his knight into c4. So now he's fully made way for these pawns to advance coming up. And now here I played rook a1, which sets a little bit of a trap. This is sort of a change of direction here. But I felt like with knight c4, he was doing a very good job of not only preparing the advance of these pawns, but also maybe pivoting the knight back to d6. And I could just imagine if the knight comes back to d6 and there's a trade... That d-pawn is fully blockaded. He can attack it with like rook c5 and start pushing these pawns. That felt like it was going to be losing. So I thought, you know what? Let's try to play rook a1. And I had a little trap in mind. So I'm hitting the a-pawn. If black plays a5, what was my idea? And again, you can pause the video if you like. 
All right, so I was hoping on a5 to play this move, bishop d1. An abrupt retreat move, a little switchback with the bishop, attacking the rook, which is in turn needed to defend the knight. And note that the rook can't go here or here safely because I have both of those squares covered. So this would actually completely turn the tables and white would be winning material. But again, just like before when I was hoping for that 96 tactic, I knew that Ding was probably not going to fall for this. <laughs> He's not 2800 plus for no reason. So he played rook takes d5 instead. Correct move. And here I had my last long think of the game. I spent a minute and 22 seconds trying to figure out if there was any alternative to taking the rook, but didn't find one. So I took the rook and then took a7, just agreeing to play this pawn down position. But still didn't seem like it was a slam dunk for black. I knew that black was going to have to work to win this. And here you can see the value of having made that h-pawn push, by the way. And it's something you guys should think about. If you get in the middle game or there's a bit of a lull in a position and the back rank looks like it could be a concern or even a distant concern, it's not a bad idea to make a luft move like that. So I'm not getting mated on the back rank. And now he played knight e5. <clears throat> played in one second, by the way. Excellent move. Puts pressure on the bishop here. Black eventually will make use of this b-pawn, but I think he noticed that my alignment issue here with the bishop uh, in back on f3 protecting the knight was a little shaky. So knight e5 makes a great deal of sense, just threatening at all times to take. Makes this whole construction a little bit weaker for me. I took on g6. If I'm going to make a draw here, I, I figure that trading the pawns is probably the best way to do it. I no longer have any realistic hope of ever winning this position. I mean, I'm down a pawn with no compensation. None of like the ticky-tack tactics I could try to set up here are ever going to work. So at this point, I'm trying to figure out how I can best attempt to draw the game. And usually in an end game where your opponent's up one pawn, you should try to trade down and... Or I shouldn't say that necessarily because oftentimes when you're ahead of pawn, you should try to trade down. But let's say... You should, you should try to get to a situation that's a little more manageable in defense. So trading at least uh, clarifies the position a little bit. If I could get to a rook end game, for instance, three versus two, I felt like I had some drawing chances. Rook end games where you're down a pawn, a lot different than like a pawn end game where you're down a single pawn, which is often losing. So that explains my, my next move as well. So I made that trade and then I played knight g5 looking for a swap of a set of minor pieces. Hard to justify anything else in my mind. I think, yeah, I forgot what the engine was recommending here. Um, but in my mind, it made sense to do this because if I delay it, then black can put further pressure on the knight on e4. There's moves like rook c4. Moreover, black's just ready to push the b-pawn at virtually any moment here. Note that I can't even take up residence behind the b-pawn because the, the bishop is defending that square. So I figured, all right, let's just swap. And he played knight takes f3. I took with my knight. And then b5, which was expected. So he starts pushing his, his nice pawn here. I went rook d7. And again, I'm trying to escape into a rook end game. But funnily enough, he actually decides to go into the rook end game. He takes on f3, allowing me this three versus two end game, which I thought perhaps harbored some hopes of salvation. So I was more expecting a move like bishop e6 or bishop c4 and followed by ushering this, this pawn up the board. But no, Ding very confidently took on f3. And it turns out that this endgame is just winning for black, as far as I can tell. So I have these bad pawns, that's true. But I thought with the ability to bring my rook behind the pawn, I might have some chances. I should mention the time situation, by the way. Um, back a few moves. Yeah, back here when I played rook takes d5. At this point, I had 2 minutes and 26 seconds left for the game, and he had 7 minutes and 18 seconds. So he was always nursing a bit of a time edge. Uh, but, yeah, in my limited time I had to assess this, it felt like I might have some drawing chances here. It didn't seem like black could win this on autopilot. But he basically proves that black can win this on autopilot, <laughs> and he knew exactly the plan. So he played b4. I played rook b7. Usually you want to get your rook behind the enemy pawn in a rook endgame. And he played rook c4, he's, so he's going to defend from the side. And now I can't do a whole lot with my rook. It just needs to stand guard 
behind this pawn. So I brought up my king. And then he started fixing his pawns on good squares. So he played g5, which rules out any attempt I ever have to play f4. You know, if I harbored a hope of playing king g3 and f4, well, that just went out the window. So I kind of saw that it was useless to bring the king up to g3 to try to do that. So I played king f1. He played king g6. I played king e2. And then he played f6. And here, it was starting to dawn on me what he was going to do. So I played rook b5, just trying to stop his king from coming out for the moment. Again, there's not a whole lot else to do. And he puts his rook on this extremely stable f4 square, supported by the pawn, defends this, and it also defends the base of this mini chain here on f6. And now his plan, quite simply, is just to bring over his king to assist in the eventual uh, promotion of the b-pawn, pushing that b-pawn. Because this rook is just beautiful, locking everything down and also locking my king down. Making sure I have to defend f3 at all moments. And now these next moves were all played in an instant. There is that two second increment. I think I was under a minute at this point. I brought my king up. Played rook b6. I try to contain his king for a second. Yeah, rook b8. King here. King e3. He goes king c5. Back a couple moves. I didn't really think about this at the time because I didn't really have any time to consider it. But it's possible I could have considered some sort of line to shift the rook to the third rank. So like rook d5, followed by rook here. But I think that should be losing too. For example, king f7, rook d3, king e6. Uh, let's say I play king d2 because the benefit of having the rook on the third rank would be to free up the king to maybe come over here. But I feel like he can play something like rook c4 and then maybe even try to jab in with his king to f4. I think it's too much to contend with. His strong b-pawn, the ability to play rook c3 even in some cases. If his king comes up to f4, he might just play rook c3 at some convenient moment like with this configuration and trade off his b-pawn for, you know, trade on c3, lose the b-pawn, but win my remaining pawns. So that is possible. Maybe it was a better defense than what I did. But I just waited with my rook on the B file while he brought his king over. And again, just notice this rook defending his only two weaknesses. I can't, I can't take either pawn. Rook B8, king C6, king E3. King comes up. I started giving some checks. That's usually what happened in these scenarios. But those of you who've studied rook endgames before will note that this is going to get to a Lucina-like position. I made a video on the Lucina Endgame, uh, Chess Fundamentals Endgame series, if you want to go check that out. But he's going to use his king to assist in advancing the pawn. I'm just waiting here. This is move number 50 now, by the way. So I give a check. He blocks with the rook. I can't hope to trade uh, and save the position, so I try to put my rook behind the pawn. But he plays b2, king d2. Now, I was a little surprised by his next move. It's totally winning, but I thought he was going to play rook b4, which would stop my rook from being able to prevent his pawn from advancing. And if I trade rooks here and play this, he can just win with king a3, king b1, and then actually, funnily enough, put me in a near stalemate, make me play f4, take f3, and then king here, and release me from the stalemate, king a2, king c2, and promote the pawn. That's what I thought he was going to do in the split second that we were playing this position. Play rook b4, but instead he played king a2. Threatening b1 promotion. I go king c4. And he gives this check. So this is often a very useful check in this endgame. To force the enemy king a file away again. So there's a whole file in between. He goes here. And now rook c5, which again, if you studied the Lucena position, you'll know about this technique. Because he can try to zigzag back out with his king and eventually block on the b5 square. So I gave a check here. Really the only way to stop him from promoting. Uh, if I attack with my king, by the way, so king here for instance, he can play just rook a5 and he'll promote next move. So I gave this check. He goes king b1. Uh, king b3 would also be working. But king b1, king d2. I actually think in hindsight at this moment, I had one last little try that, you know, would have made for a cute attempt at least, rook h8. 
The idea being that if you place king c1 trying to promote the pawn, looks winning at first, but I have rook h1 checkmate. <laughs> and if that had actually happened, I would not at all have felt good about winning that game, but it would have been pretty hilarious. <laughs> so I wish I would have tried rook h8, but yeah, on rook h8, all black has to do is play a move like uh, rook d5 check, for instance, is good enough. Just force the king away, that white king away. If I play something like king here, now he can safely play this. If I play rook h1, he can block. And this is the problem in many of these variations. Even if I actually get to take the B pawn, he can still come over and just pick up these pawns and win easily. But instead, I played king d2, trying to box this king in. But he gives this check. I have to step away. Note king c3 allows king c1, followed by promotion. Standard Lucena business. So king e2. And now he starts bringing the king out on this side. I give a check. King here. Check king here. Here I played rook b7. If I continue checking, straight Lucena technique. Rook b8 check. Rook b5, this eventual block. This is the so-called the, the bridge, building the bridge. And finally, this pawn is going to promote. So, king c3. I played rook b7, just trying to wait. Uh, by the way, if this was actually a pure Lucena without these pawns being present at all, it would still be winning for black. In that case, as the defensive side, I think I would try this. Because there is a chance that they could go wrong by playing rook d4 here. Whereupon you can play rook takes b2. So, it is possible for them to do that. And you can do that. Here, though, that wouldn't even um, probably... Well, it wouldn't work in this exact position because of rook e5 mate. <laughs> so, that's why I didn't, uh, I didn't play king e3. But possible defense if you're ever on the hopeless side of this endgame. If that happens, by the way, in Lucena, you can just give a check here and force the king further away. Is an easy way to win it. Sometimes you can even play the rook down and threaten promotion. But rook b7. And now, final move of the game, he played rook d4. This just prepares to play rook b4 since I wasn't checking him. And at this moment... I had seven seconds left, he had six minutes and six seconds left, and I resigned the game. Threw in the towel. Rook before's coming, and not much I can do about it. So, 61 moves, I go down, but it was an enormous pleasure to play this game. It was a real privilege. I felt like I didn't play that bad. I really didn't, and even in analyzing it now, it's not easy to see where I began to go wrong even with the benefit of stockfish. So the position right around here is definitely critical. And I think in hindsight, d5 can be criticized. But at the time, I played that move without any reservations. To me, it just seemed like the consistent thing to do to try to trade the bishops and get an initiative. So I don't mind losing a game where it came down to kind of a fundamental difference in understanding. Like he's probably just looked at these positions in much greater detail than I have. And, you know... If I played d5 with a clear conscience and it didn't work out, that's fine. I don't even think I made that many mistakes after this. Knight g5, that was probably my other dubious move of this game. I think this did lead to issues, but honestly, at this point, I think black's already a little bit better. I bet if you were to deeply, deeply analyze this, black's already better, even if I play something like queen d4 check. And after this, I did my best to try to stabilize things and look for counterplay when it was available, like pitching the a pawn and try to, trying to use the d pawn. But he kept excellent control the whole way. So kudos to Mr. Ding Loren for a fine display here. And instructive to see his rook endgame technique too. Just the confidence in which he played bishop takes f3. I thought, especially given my time situation, he would, he would retain the bishop and try to use it to run the b-pawn. But evidently he just knew that this was a win. Based on this technique of putting the rook in on b4, solidifying all the pawns. And then marching his king over and executing the Lucena technique. So thank you to Mr. Ding for this game. If you're wondering what happened in the match, we ended up losing 9.5 to 6.5. So the Changdu Pandas beat us. I played two other grandmasters, Wang Yue, who's amazingly strong himself, and Zhao Jun, another grandmaster, 2600 plus. I lost those games. They were interesting, but I lost them. I did beat their board four who was much lower rated. I think they were in the 1900s. But very interesting match. If you're curious about Ding Loren's FIDE page, by the way, 
This is his current FIDE card. You can see he's rated 2813, world number four. In fact, if we click into the top players, let's see if we can go to the top player list. Yeah, you'll see him right here. Magnus up there at number one, Fabio at, Fabiano at number two. Shakurar Mamadyarov, another underrated player, I think, uh, at number three, but Ding Loren, and they're all pretty tight right here. I mean, the difference between Ding Loren and Magnus Carlsen is 22 points at the moment, so impressive stuff. Watch for him in the future if he's not already on your radar. So, hope you guys enjoyed this and my thoughts about this game. Thanks to Chess.com for putting on the Pro Chess League. You guys should definitely follow it. I'll drop a link or two in the description. And let me know if you guys have any thoughts or comments on this. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you again soon.